Good to see you all here. More than I expected, which is good. My name is John Foster from Topcon Europe. I'm based in the UK in Cambridge. My background is primarily software. So I used to work for a company called Navisworks. And then I worked for Autodesk for a while until um, I joined Topcon recently. So I'm looking after BIM business development in Europe. So today's session, I want to give you a general overview, really, including some tips, perhaps for, the, for those of you who are fairly new to laser scanning in the context of BIM. And I want to highlight some tips and highlight those with some experiences from a Topcon service provider in the UK. not moving me forward, so I will go back to manual means. So the class summary, I'm sure you've all read it, lots of words there. Um, so I, I'm not going to read through that, but let's just reference that. Um, there's no handouts, unfortunately, for this session, but I'm very happy to send out the PowerPoint to you all afterwards. If there's any questions, please come and see me afterwards, or, or come and see us on the stand on the Topcon stand at the Exhibition Center. But the key learning objectives for this session, I mean, we've seen a huge growth in laser scanning over the last few years with mass data capture. And the technology, both in the hardware and the software. Um, so, so key objectives, key points I want to make is it's, it's, a, it's a proven method. Um, it's faster than you might think, and hopefully you'll, you'll see that uh, as I go through. Selecting the right workflow is key. And perhaps it should be an essential part of your project workflows going forward for many, for many applications. So the agenda, I want to go through uh, these points. I want to go, start by just going through the state of BIM, go through some laser scanning in practice using an example project, as I say, from a service provider in the UK, and talk about continuous as-built, and then talk about, um, finish off with the BIM feedback loop using some examples of some of our technology. Quick slide about Topcon. Uh, you probably all know about Topcon now from yesterday from the keynote speech when Topcon were up there on the screen. As you, as you saw, we're a platinum sponsor at AU. And Topcon's a technology company. So we've got a proven track record in innovation right from the, the SLR camera principle back in the 1950s in consumer products right through pioneering GPS solutions, through to the first self-leveling robotic total station that you can see down in the exhibition center. So we're a technology and innovative company, but we are really, you know, I think about ourselves as a data company, because everything we do is about data, capturing data, analyzing data, managing that data, and sharing that data. So as I say, state of BIM, what I'm going to use here is, is really talk about what's happening in the UK um, and use that as an example very quickly because BIM, BIM is really happening in the UK um, and it's being driven in the main, I guess, by, by government policy. So it's perhaps, you know, there's government policies in other countries in Europe, but I think Perhaps in the UK, it's, it's the most ambitious, ambitious mandate. Um, so um, in the UK, from 2016, all public projects, BIM will be 
will have to be used. It's mandatory um, starting in 2016. So that's really put a big emphasis on BIM and uh, you know, the, in, the, in the construction industry, it's really getting people um, into, into BIM in a big way. And even since that announcement back in 2011, government statistics have showed that even, even now up to this time, they've saved two billion pounds, over two billion pounds on public building projects. And 66% have been of those projects have been delivered on time since that announcement. So we're really, BIM is really happening in the UK. But there's a, big, there's a big gap, and I just want to talk about that gap. So as we see population growth growing exponentially, construction has to keep up with it and grow at similar rates. So various studies have showed us that by 2030, as you can see, as you can see on the slide, the gap between the construction demand and our ability to perform and even fund that need is huge. Globally, that gap is about 29 trillion euros. So it's, so it's massive. It's a huge challenge, but a huge opportunity. And so how are we going to bridge that gap? Technology is going to help. Hardware, software, but more importantly, really um, applying it in the best and smartest way to satisfy that, that, that future need. And BIM promotes new ways of working, as we see. So with cloud technology, with the constant connectivity that is available, all information is available all the time. So it's giving huge opportunities to change those traditional workflows to find new ways of doing things to be more, f to be quicker and more efficient right through the whole life cycle from 2D, 3D to scheduling, cost management and where most of the cost is in a project in facilities management. So we should all be aware that it's not just the hardware, it's not just the software and those technologies. It's all about the integrated workflows, these new workflows giving us productivity improvements. That's why Topcon and Autodesk have signed a strategic partnership to address the needs of our customers. So resulting in improved workflows, seamless integration between hardware and software to make people more efficient in those, in those BIM practices. I want to just introduce and reference um, the supplier, one of our uh, partner companies in the UK, the Topcon service provider. They're called bimsurveys.eu, based in Cardiff, in Wales. Um, their managing director, Nick Russell, unfortunately couldn't be here to present this um, himself, but I'm going to do that on his behalf. But they've, the BIM surveys have got a long pedigree in laser scanning, in mass data capture, and offering services to their clients. And I just wanted to share some of their views. So some interesting comments from Nick and at BIM surveys that you, can, that you can read. First one, laser scanning enables us, us to efficiently capture large amount of accurate data in a very short period of time on site. So that leads to reductions in, in time spent visiting sites um, multiple times so just by capturing it in, in one visit. An increase in projects, in refurbishment, revamp projects. So 
So that's, we've seen that across the board in, in the UK. So less planning requirements, lower cost implications. So lots of refurb projects happening where laser scanning is essential. And a very good point, that final point about, you know, when we mentioned BIM to some organizations, it can be very scary for clients. But if it's presented in the right way, uh, then it's a huge opportunity for them to, to improve the way they're working and manage projects throughout the whole life cycle. So let's talk about scanning in practice. What I want to um, discuss is a few points here. Initially, you know, scanning is becoming much more accessible. A lot more people. It's becoming accessible to a lot more people. New technologies available. Um, reduced capital costs. So scanners are, are coming down in costs. Lots of different types of scanning. Static airborne mobile vehicle mounted scanners, even handheld scanners. You can see a number downstairs in the exhibition room. And, you know, those traditional markets, the offshore market, um, it, scanning's been around for a long time. But we're seeing in, in a lot more um, uh, markets nowadays. And those applications, those scan to BIM applications, especially where we're seeing um, enhanced usage of, of scanning, especially in building retrofit, as I've just said, in as-built verification, but also in, in things like progress monitoring and scheduling. And when we want to achieve an accurate survey, there's a number of considerations. So I want to briefly go through scanning, control, combining scan information, and other solutions. So when we consider scanning, we should be asking ourselves questions, such as why do we, how do we want to use the data? Do we want to use it for visualization? Do we want to use it for capturing the structure, for modeling from, um, from the point cloud? So all about how we're going to use the data. Scanning for purpose, where's the data getting processed? Are we going to model in CAD? Do we need to model in CAD? You can do an awful lot just with the point cloud with some of the software tools. Do we need color? Or is black and white, is monochrome enough? Are we using third party imagery? So all these questions, and one of the most important is the last one there, which is how are we going to use it um, in the future? How are we going to use the scans that we're doing through the life cycle? What's the most value we can get out of, out of uh, that point cloud? So it's all about maximizing the value of the scanning, maximizing the information throughout the life cycle of the model. So as an example of a scan, there you can see um, a five-minute windowed scan done with the GLS 2000. So good for visualization. This was done at three millimeter, at 10 meter density. So the slowest in terms of the scan, but the highest density. The lowest density for the GLS 2000 is five centimeters at 10 meters but it depends what you want to use it for. Obviously, this was just a, a part, it's not a 360 scan, it's a windowed scan of that building. But do we need that level of detail? Combined, so doing scans on each of the four corners of the building gives us that high level detail with the uh, three millimeter scan density. But this one, and you can see uh, moving from, the, you can see the level of detail, the difference moving to the five centimeter point cloud. So that's more than adequate to define floor plans if you want to model from it, say in Revit. But when we look at it, the same view there, the five centimeter, so lower density, Building again, scan from those four positions, 
But the total time for, for all those four scans using that lower density it was about 40 minutes. So, you know, when you, when you think about scanning a complete building with the view of modeling from it, you know, including moving the scanner to the four different points of the building, in total that was 40 minutes. So it's not, not uh, taking a long time. And the other question, coming back to that, do you really need to, 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 to model from the scan? Is it enough for you to take that scan into Navisworks, compare it with other information that you can bring into Navisworks? You can clash detect with Navisworks. You can clash detect the point cloud with design information. You can render point clouds now in 3ds Max. So you know there's not necessary. You don't necessarily have to go through the overhead and the cost of modelling from the point cloud. Finishing off the data, so we can drop that. Uh, we can generate floor plans and elevation, drop it into Revit, and use that as, as the basis to, to start modeling. So very, very simple. Next question, should we be using color scans or not? It used to be that uh, a, a color scan was a big overhead because it took a lot longer to do your scan. Uh, but that's not the case anymore. With the GLS 2000, it only takes another minute to do a color scan than a monochrome scan. And you're getting much more value that you can use downstream having that, those RGB, those colors, that photorealistic uh, image from, from the high density scans. So you may as well do it with a, with a GLS 2000. Other scanners, perhaps older scanners, you know, it is going to be a big overhead taking time. But now, um, you may as well do it. Hard to argue against. Um, the value of having an RGB scan. But, you know, even if you've got that, you can turn off the colors and you can use intensity values. And intensity values from, the, from a scan can give you much, um, much more rich information based on, you know, material, the water content of, of, the, um, of the building. Um, and it can highlight changes in surface. So you can see in this example the... Uh, the red is the high intensity um, information that we've got back. So, you know, it's uh, what I'm suggesting is with, with the more modern scanners, with the GLS 2000, you would, you would always, you'd be silly not to do um, a color scan, but um, to get that extra value. So once you've done your scanning, next step is how do you, how do you fit all these scans together? So what I want to take you through is control and uh, like an evolution of registration because that has changed as technology has changed. So right through from object-based registration through to cloud to cloud. You, you spoke about intensity. What does yep. that really mean? What do the colors represent? The colors represent the clarity of the, of the, um, of the, of the laser scan. Yeah, so flat surfaces, you would get a, you, you'd get a greater intensity, windows, et cetera, rougher surfaces, where you're not getting, um, it would be a lower intensity. And how do you use that, that information? What, what's the benefit of that? The benefits are that you can see a lot more information. So it could be, as I said, um, it could be uh, the material, the different surface, the color. So if you had a white building, um, you'd get a higher intensity, a better, a better feedback. So lo lots of different ways that intensity can give you lots more information that intensity can give you than, say, the RGB scan, or in addition to that. So just going through um, control. Let's go through, from the start, object-based control. So initially, this relies on, again, the different workflows depending on, on, on your, your project and what you're trying to get out of it. So object-based control relies on seeing the same part of the same object 
from three positions in adjacent scans. So what you need to be aware of, and you need to probably make field sketches um, on site, is what objects you're using, usually the corner of buildings or whatever. So what you're doing is, what, what this means is, is, is less work in the field, a few field sketches, perhaps a few notes, but more manual manipulations. So when you're back in the office, you need to identify in each scan those common positions in adjacent scans. Um, next one is target registration. I'm sure we're, we've all seen target registration again a bit. This is really a belt and braces approach from a, a survey point of view in that it needs more work in the field. So putting your targets in the right positions um, and then uh, positioning those targets either with the total station or with the scanner itself. So the scanner, GLS 2000, can um, find that position of the target. So three common targets in each adjacent scan. But it's probably um, a, a more accurate and a more certain way of um, registration, less risk, less processing in the office because the registration's been done um, automatically with the targets. Occupation back site, that is what it's called, in, I, I guess, in, top, in the Topcon world. Um, but this is really talking about using a network of control points that have been predefined. So you've got points that have been marked out on site that have been set up with GPS or a total station and then you're positioning your laser scanner at those points. So if we've got four around a building, you'd start off at point one, put your laser scanner over that point, have your target at the next known point, in, in the case of a GLS 2000, that would be a prism, and then complete your scans and then work round, so move the scanner from that first position to the next position and move the target to the, to the next corner. So I guess um, much more upfront work. The advantage is that um, data is registered as you go, not necessary to have overlapping scans. You don't need as many scans um, uh, like you do in some of the other methods. And then coming on to the more recent software focus technique, which is cloud to cloud. So this uses shape recognition software. So basically, uh, it, needs, it still needs good practice in the field for setting up your scans because you need to make sure that those scans are in order and overlapping because what it's doing, what the software is doing is um, recognizing common shapes between the scans to um, automatically do that control. So you do need more scans uh, to get that overlap. Overlap is usually between 30-50% um, for lower risk. More, scan, more scans required, lower resolution probably, so it's a bit quicker even though you need more scans. Um, and, and because you're doing more scans, you get less shadow area as well. But all the processing is in the software. So you, so you do need to be careful um, because if you've got a lot of symmetry in the objects that you're, you're, you're scanning, then um, you need to be careful. In this example, you can see that um, we've got two scans with an overlap. Um, but, but there are significant differences. It's not totally symmetrical. If you had a very symmetrical building, for instance, then it's probably best safer to use another method of control, such as targets um, uh, in addition. But that cloud-to-cloud -cloud registration can be done with ScanMaster, which is, which is Topcon's own uh, registration software, or it can be done with, with Autodesk Recap. Um, those two scans were, were again, two five-minute scans um, combined uh, with using targets as well. 
the other thing you've got to be important, uh, you've got to be careful with in um, cloud to cloud registration is that, in, this is an example in recap, that you have the order set up. So you've done your overlapping scans and you need to make sure that you're selecting in the right order to capture that overlap. And that's just a screen grab of uh, selecting adjacent scans. So recap, which, which most of you are probably familiar with, is the Autodesk family of products, which allows you to do registration, to um, combine multiple formats, multiple formats of point cloud, and also allows you to, I don't know if many of you have used the consumer product, the app, 123D Catch, to do photogrammetry. So when it's... Um, um, linking photos up to create a 3D model. That's also part of ReCap. So what you can do with ReCap is combine point cloud information, combine, combine photogrammetry information uh, into one model. And then you can collaborate with uh, ReCap 360, so share information, share all that point cloud information, and then distribute it, use it, in lots of Autodesk products, as you can see below, whether it's Navisworks, Revit, uh, Infraworks, etc. So let's talk about this project in the UK. A bit of background: it is a multi-million pound public redevelopment. So it's a revamp. So it's, this is an old school in Wales. And it is, um, it's a revamp. They're redeveloping it into a multi-use community centre. So a few points about it. It's publicly funded. Multi-million multi pound redevelopment. There was no existing accurate site data. So no, there was no data at all with this project. The deliverables were external elevations, floor pans, plus a full accurate Revit model. But not a high level of detail was required. Considerations. So this took three days on site to georeference, scan, register, and merge all, all that data together. And then, to do the, the modeling in Revit, it took another eight man days of modeling. They used, um, they used GLS 2000 scanner, and they used cloud-to-cloud -cloud registration in ReCap, which all worked well. And uh, QA was also carried out using re ReCap. The project was completed on time and within budget. Um, some issues um, based on intensity, I guess, as well, that, that you raised before, that they had some issues when they had to take extra care when they were um, scanning through windows and glass partitions, so they were getting some... Um, um, offsets in data when, the, when they had glass um, um, in the scan. Another major issue was, which, which is general, you know, with scanning, is that there were huge data sets. Um, huge, one, one um, office block, that, that project that they did, had half a terabyte of data. So that's an awful amount of data that you need to manage. Um, and you can see what they're saying there. They had software crashes, PC memory issues. So, you know, when you're managing point clouds and point cloud software, you have to make sure that you have the, uh, the capabilities in terms of your, the machines you're using. And they had some issues with delivering um, with version compatibilities between Revit, etc. Uh, which was always an issue and, and is probably 
uh, a very common issue anyway. Some screenshots that we've got out of recap of the project. Quite detailed scans. As I say, this was two days of indoor scanning and, and one day of outdoor scanning. And I've actually got, um, I can show you the model that we have in Navisworks as well. If I can see my mouse. No, I can't, I'm afraid. It won't let me out of there. Right, I, I'm trying to go back into the slideshow, but I've lost my mouse. Your screen is extended right now, and I can see the mouse on Ah. We're back. Well, if you want to see the Navisworks model, you can, you can come and have a look later. Um, I, I've just got the model that, that, that they delivered in Navisworks, and it looks, it looks pretty good, and the quality is, uh, is fantastic. So we're back on there. OK, so, so let's talk about continuous as-built. So as I say, the, the speed. Uh, which is pretty, pretty evident there, the speed of capturing um, using laser scanning means that it's, people are looking more and more at applications to scan on a more regular basis, to scan for scheduling, for um, finding updates, for validating on, a, on a, almost a daily basis. And looking forward to that, you know, it's, it's, it's all about looking forward to which methods should we be using. So it's all about tool selection. Should we be using mobile data, UAVs, terrestrial scanning, or indeed um, combining different methods. So this is an example. You may have seen it downstairs on the... Um, on the exhibition center, where it's a, the Bambara Castle example, where we have different methods of data capture, terrestrial scanning, the UAV, aerial mapping. The mobile mapping. And then combining all that together in, in recap.
So all that kit is, um, you can see down in the exhibition center on the Tuckcon stand. Another example, um, which is interesting, is another customer in the UK construction contractor. And they wanted to perform a rapid assessment of conditions on site um, and validation. So, so really, what, it's interesting because they had, in initial discussions, they had dismissed scanning because they felt it would have taken too long. They thought it would be one day on site and then it would be eight, nine days before they got any val valuable information back from, um, from that. Um, on, on further discussion, we, we took a GLS 2000 and showed them, convinced them, I guess, that that wouldn't be the case. And we went on site, and within one hour of arrival, we had given them enough information so they could val validate the design uh, against the existing site conditions. So that, that was a great example, and they were very surprised that, you know, after an hour on site, that they had that information. The information they got, they, we scanned basically one scan, took it into Revit, and it highlighted immediately some of the issues. Um, and you can see some of the issues um, with that validation. So very valuable information um, that, that very quick to get back as well. So talking about, um, finally, the feedback loop. And this is a, a little video um, from showing Autodesk point layout in Revit. But it's uh, now Autodesk technology allows you to, to gather feedback and compare the point cloud with the model in Revit. So you've done your point cloud, you've done your scan, taken it into Revit, and then it allows you to get feedback on that. So what it's doing is allowing you to generate, I guess, like a heat map of the deviation of the point cloud from the model. So you can see there the different intensity values based on that deviation. So once you've been through that scan to BIM process, then you can validate uh, automatically using um, Autodesk tools. And combined with scanning, um, with field BIM, I guess, we can, we can also carry out layout and quality checks um, using robotic total station. This is a good example of the integration between Autodesk and Topcon and the strategic partnership that, we're, that, we've, uh, that we've signed. So taking BIM data into the field, um, taking survey points from Revit, from Navisworks, using Autodesk point layout to define those points, and then taking it into the field um, via both 360 tools um, and the new layout tool, but also through our own magnet controllers, and also going the other way. So gathering information, gathering as-built information, taking it straight from the robotic total station for quality checking back into Navisworks or the Revit model. So the LM100 um, is, is that hardware from Topcon that integrates directly with the new BIM 360 layout app. So this is controlled directly from Magnet or from BIM 360, so you can link directly from the BIM 360 layout app directly and control the robotic total station from that iPad app. So it's very simple to use. It's, it's making that uh, additional surveying tool much more accessible to a lot more people. So it's aimed at um, the tradesmen, the foremen, people out in the field who can go and do some quality checking, do some setting out, just with his iPad attached to that robotic total station. 
combined with the fact that it, there's just one switch on the robotic total station, it's self-leveling, needs no setting up, so just one button control. And again, it's all about the workflow, so from the office to the cloud via sharing information in the cloud between Magnet360 and um, BIM360, Fi sending files to the controller to perform the construction layout, sending that, using that to do installations, setting out, gathering, checking as built information, and taking it back into the office for validation. So it's that complete uh, BIM workflow um, using those integrated, seamlessly integrated tools. So Autodesk point layout is fundamental to this. So that's where the points are created on top of AutoCAD, Navisworks, or Revit. It sits on top of all those products. And, and then it can connect directly using um, magnet controllers, or as I say, um, the iPad running BIM 360 layout. The points are collected in the field or used for setting out directly with the robotic total station, the LM100. And then we can gather as built information, take it back into the cloud um, and validate for quality process. So if you go on to the um, Autodesk construction area in the exhibition center, uh, you can see that in action. You'll, you can see they've got the LN100 set up with a prism with the BIM360 layout app on the iPad attached to that. Um, and you can step through that workflow. Um, as I say, unique, um, hu huge benefits in um, productivity and, and error reduction. So in summary, you know, the scan to BIM process is, is becoming much more automated, but it, you know, with hardware and software promoting those, those new workflows. Um, but you still need to have good practice in the field to reduce that risk, especially with your control methodologies that you want to use. Workflows are faster. With, with the new scanners, with the GLS 2000, with the software that is um, uh, registering that information with cloud-to-cloud -cloud registration, the whole workflows are becoming increasingly faster. And it's a, there's a clearer return on investment to scan. So if you are looking at purchasing your own scanner, there's, there's huge opportunities to maximize that asset throughout the workflows of projects whether that be as-built capture, continuous as-built capture, um, validation, as we've seen in that example, or scheduling. So the whole progress management side of it. So, as I say, huge opportunities to, to, to maximize, um, if, you, if you're buying your own scanner, to maximize, maximize the use of that asset. So please visit the TopCon or the Autodesk construction stand. Uh, you can see all those tools in action. Um, and if you have any questions, please see me later or uh, come and see us on the stand. Thank you very much.